What a blessing. We're having technical difficulties back there, so I have to bring my laptop up here. I apologize. Um, really excited about this morning. If this is your first time to the refuge, may I say welcome. The fact that you would come here on a day that you know you feel like sleeping in. Can I get an amen? amen. I mean, that is what this weather brings to me, just that cozy up, eat as much as you can, and watch football. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. But I am glad you're here. Just know this is not a place where you're going to find judgment. Uh, we just don't have it here. Our desire is that we all spend time with God today. And don't pass up the opportunity that you have right now to hear the words of the Lord. Because understand the words of the Lord have life in them. And they can change us. They can help us in any way. And today, I'm really excited about our sermon this morning. And sometimes I believe we complicate things way too much. Um, I don't know if you've ever had a relationship that you got extremely complicated in. You try to figure everything out. I'm probably speaking to most of the women. Can I get an amen, right? Because isn't it the women that go to the men and go, tell me how you feel about me? And the guy's are like, I feel hungry. You want to make me a sandwich? I mean, what are you looking for? And oh, I need to know what you're feeling and your thoughts. And, and, and sometimes we just make it complicated. Um, I think a lot of times in our spiritual walk, we get complicated in things. And I believe the enemy uses complications to get you confused. Am I doing this right? Am I doing this wrong? And why did this happen? And what's going on here? And, and a lot of times the enemy likes to put so many things in between us and God that we feel like we will never get it figured out. One thing we must understand today is Jesus is here. He's not far off. He's not far away, and I know many of us may not feel like he's right here. He has never forsaken any one of us. Can I get an amen? amen? Today I want to read scripture as our prayer this morning. John chapter 15, 1 through 5 says this. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That is a huge truth that we must embrace and Understand it for its simplicity. If you are wanting to have a relationship with God, you cannot have a relationship with God without the Son. You can't do anything apart from Jesus. Neither can I. Now, in my life, I have tried and tried to impress God. Has anybody else tried to do that? Where you tell God, I promise I will never do that again. And you even make this oath and burn candles and take your own communion. Lord, never again. And next thing you know, you fall apart. It's because a lot of times we think our relationship with God is going to be based off our performance. Let me give you a truth this morning. You and I have already failed. Can we understand that this morning? We've already failed. We've tried our best. We might have even almost did something good. But eventually, we realized we failed. When I was young, I would ask that, man, God, why is this so hard? Why don't you just come and, and ask me what I need, and I'll tell you. And let's really look how that would work out. Let's, let's think about that. If Jesus showed up today and said, you know what, you guys are great people. What do you want? I'll do anything you want. Many of us would say, 
king of the world would be fine. Yes, make me king of the world, but in your name. That way it's official. How about win the lottery, Father? Lord, help me win the lottery. Give me the numbers. You know them. Help me win the lottery. I would use that money for your kingdom. (laughs) And the Lord's like, yeah, right. Why don't you just keep working at your job? How about that? We don't know what's best for us. If we knew what was best for us, we would not have these issues. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So to understand that we can do nothing without Jesus should not be a statement of confinement, but more of a statement of freedom. That's right, I can't do anything without Jesus, so that makes it simple. In order for me to grow, I must do one thing. Get to know Jesus. Oh, no, no, no. You got to pray 20 minutes a day. No, no, no. You got to memorize scripture and you got to be able to uh, recite the Lord's Prayer in French and Latin. I don't know why anybody do that in French, right? You have to perform this way. You have to look this way. You got to do this. It's got to be real complicated. You have to do this on Sunday. You have to do this on Saturday. And you better not miss Wednesday night. And don't forget to tithe. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> get a weak amen on that one. <laughs> amen, yeah. amen, whatever. Jesus is simply saying, know me. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. You cannot grow. You cannot get better. We like to think that we are a spiritual culture in this world, don't we? If I come up to you, and I, and I had a coffee with a friend this week, and it was kind of funny. We were talking about this. If I come up to you and say, do you believe in God? That's not offensive, is it? You could say yes or no. But if I say, do you believe in Jesus? Ooh, it's a little personal. Because God is just whatever he's out there. And in fact, we can, we can watch award shows uh, and... And people will come up to the front after they win their award and say, First of all, I would like to thank God for giving me the ability to sing these songs that have a bunch of cussing and, and, and being half naked on the video. Hallelujah for that talent, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and we thank God. And I wonder how many times I've thanked God for things that were actually offensive to him. Thank you, Lord, for helping Texas Tech win that football game. Now, we we know Jesus loves Tech. Can we get an amen? We know it. Obviously, he loves them because he's given them a servant's heart. That's why at Texas Tech, we say, go ahead and score your touchdown. Uh Uh-huh. No, it's not that we're bad. We just want to help others. That's what we want to be servants to other offenses, and our defense says here. But how many times do we pray that? Lord, help my team win. Lord, help me be a victor over my problems and all my enemies. And that is totally contrary to what Jesus says. When Jesus says, pray for your enemies. See, it's about knowing him, not about performing in what we think is spiritual. I can say I'm a spiritual person because I light incense every Friday. I really don't. But what if I did? That doesn't make me spiritual, does it? If I can recite the entire Bible verbatim, does that make me spiritual? It's only if I apply it and know the author of the Bible. In fact, look at this. Jesus is having this moment with his disciples in John chapter 14, 1 through 14. He has told his disciples, guys, I got to go away for a while and and you can't come with me yet. And as I go away, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And what's funny is the disciples are really panicking and worrying. They're going, well, Jesus, how come we can't go with you? I mean, we've given our life for you. We've spent three years with you. We left everything and we're following you. And now you're saying, you have to go to a place. How come we can't go? 
And sometimes we almost have that conversation with God. God, help me out. Jesus, what's going on in my life? Help me out. And sometimes we don't know that Jesus is already working on our situations. But look at this scripture out of John chapter 14, 1 through 14. It says this. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, then I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Listen to this. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for me for anything in my name, and I will do it. The disciples are having a hard time understanding this. You're going away and you're saying you're going away. Where are you going? And Jesus says, you know where I'm going. I'm going to the Father. You know the way. And they're like, we don't know where it is. Is it by post? Is it east of La Mesa? Where is it? He says, I'm going to the Father. How do we get there? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except through me. This is what Jesus is saying. And then I think I would be a lot like Philip. I'm more of the put up or shut up kind of guy. And so Philip's like, hey, Jesus, I think I can wrap this up for all of us. If you'll just show us the Father, we'll believe you. And Jesus goes, you're looking at him. I am in my Father. My Father is in me. I don't do anything without my Father telling me to do it first. This is what it looks like when you're in front of God is in the flesh of Jesus Christ. And that was hard for them because they're going, but we've, we've been buddy-buddy with you. We walk, we can see you. And Jesus is telling them, the Father is right here. He is before you. Why is that so hard for us to believe? Why is that hard for us as people to believe that Jesus is here? Sometimes in my life, I know of somebody, but that does not mean I know them. Has anybody ever had this experience? Maybe you've met a celebrity. I got to meet a guy named Cordell Stewart. Anybody know who he is? You football fans may know. He was the quarterback for the Steelers a while back. And I shook his hand. He was so cool, and his hand was huge, and I was like, I was trying my hardest not to fangirl on him, really trying my hardest, because he, we, he just played, he had just won a playoff game, we're at dinner, he comes up to the table, he's talking to one of our friends, he's like, hey, I'm Cordell, and, and we're like, hey, what's up? And I shake his hand, I'm like, good game, Cordell, that's pretty good, I'd probably done it myself, but, and Cordell meets as he walks off, and then I talk, I'm like, oh my gosh, that was Cordell Stewart. Now, I met Cordell Stewart, but I'd be a fool to go, oh, me and Cor? Yeah, we're that close. I don't call him Cordell no more. It's me and Cor. Yeah, he knows me. We hang out. No, I really don't know him, do I? In fact, if I was going to knock on the door right now, I'd be like, hey, Cordell, it's me. He'd be like, hey, could you call security? It's one of those crazy white kids again. 
Are we going to hang out? Aren't you going to ask me in? I don't know you. A lot of us can walk around professing that we know God, but if we don't know Jesus, we don't know God. In fact, a lot of us in this room like to make God out to be what we think he would be. Some of us in this room, if we had a piece of paper and I asked you to draw out an image of God, you might draw an old man with a lightning bolt. You look like Jay here with his beard. I knew you were godly. Oh, it's a cane. Yeah, a cane. We don't know what God would look like. But I can tell you who he is if you look at the person of Jesus. That's what we have to understand. We have to be okay with that. That the only way to Jesus, I mean, the only way through the, to the Father is through Jesus. I want to make this statement. Understand that salvation is not a destination. It is a person. It's a person. Righteousness is a person. Holiness is a person. Sanctification, all these great Christian rhetoric words, it is a person. It's that simple. Travis, when should we take communion? Whenever that person tells you to take communion. Oh, when, when should we read the Bible? I would say as much as you can for one reason. To get to know Jesus. To get to know the person. I have had friends in, in, that were extremely knowledgeable in Scripture. In fact, they could beat you up with Scripture. Anybody ever know somebody like that? Boy, they love to spit Scripture, right? It says in the mighty word of God that you will obey your mother and father. How does that work out? <laughs> if you're like me and you're a kid like me, it's like, well, I don't care what the Bible said. Check this out. Do what you're going to go do anyway. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Dad, I don't think he was talking about a bat. Just between you and me, that's a loose translation. <laughs> it's one thing to say, I forgive you. It's another thing to extremely forgive somebody. Am I right? It's one thing when you have enemies that are trying to consume you and Jesus tells you to pray for your enemies. It is difficult to pray for people that you don't like. Amen. Jesus never said... It's all about your emotions. He said it's all about obedience. And there is an application to that. To know Jesus is to obey him. Now a lot of us hate that word obedience. Has anybody ever been told you were disobedient? There might be two or three of you here. Yeah. <laughs> you weren't compliant with the law. Possibly. In Scripture, it says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. We must no longer look at Jesus as a historical figure or a figure who is far away. We must begin to see Jesus as somebody who can live within us. So Scripture tells us it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And there's times when you're driving down the street and somebody cuts you off that it does not look like Christ is living in you. Yeah. Doesn't mean you're perfect, but you got to get to that point where you say, Father, forgive me for doing what I just did, giving them the Texas howdy. <laughs> Jesus, that's not what you do. Would you please forgive me and help me? That's part of walking this thing out. Notice this. If salvation is not a person, then we would have found life in the law. We would have found life in the law, but... Because we could not find life in the law, the word was made flesh in order to fulfill the law. All the law did for us was show us how we should be. All we did to the law was show ourselves that we could not follow it. Can I get an amen? amen. Every one of us in here has broken the law of God. In fact, I have a story that happened yesterday about breaking the law. Some of us in this room have broken the law. One or two. Yesterday, I went to a basketball game. It's my daughter's first basketball game as a high school student. 
This was in Wall, Texas, which is three and a half hours away, which means we drove three and a half hours, watched one hour game, and drove three and a half hours back. Praise the Lord. <laughs> they won, but that's beside the point. On the way home, I asked my wife if she would drive, to which she said, absolutely, I'm extremely obedient to your every will. <laughs> Isn't that right, baby? It didn't quite go like that? Okay. So she gets in the driver's seat, and I'm in the car, and I'm working on my computer, putting some things together, and she's driving, everything's nice, we're listening to the, we're kind of listening to the tech thing on the radio, and as we're driving, and all of a sudden, I hear something, I don't know what it is, but it's an odd sound to me, and it's the sound of, and I'm like, what is that? And I look over, and the speedometer's right at 90, 95. And I'm thinking, I'm looking behind, is somebody chasing us? What is going, is there an emergency happening? And she's just, ah. I was like, baby, you were going 95. And she's like, oh, oh for, for goodness gracious. And she started slowing down. She's like, I'm sorry, I can't help it. See, my wife has this disease. And it's called, I got to get there first. Speed limit to her is an option because in her mind, me, I'm the old man that drives like, let's stop at this store and see what's in there. Let, let's go to this historical landmark. Takes me a day to get anywhere. She's opposite. It's not about getting from point A to point B. It's about getting from point A to point B first. And if she's driving and there's a car in the horizon that is ahead of her, then in her mind, she's second place. We got to get there. And I can prove it because I continued to say, you're going 85. Oh, my gosh, I'm sorry. And then pretty soon, baby, you're going speeding again. Baby, you're speeding again. I said, you got to understand there's a law, and if you don't obey the law, then you're going to get. She got pulled over. <laughs> Here he comes. And she's like, oh, darn it. She pulls over, and I guarantee you my face was like that of, see? <laughs> Look what you did now, hmm? <laughs> Look what you did. The cop comes to the window, and my wife has already given him the license and registration, and she is getting upset as the cars are passing her. She's like, oh, let's go, let's go. She's looking, he's back at the car, and she's like, I just passed that guy. Come on. I'm like, baby, he is not the, the pace car. Okay, this is serious. We break the law. In fact, sometimes when the law is made, we as humans will push it. We always do. If you tell your child, do not cross this line. They push it, don't they? The law can't help us. The law just shows us that we can't do it. So God made the law in flesh. And what did Jesus do when he came down? He said, follow me. That's how you get to know somebody. Follow me. Have you ever changed into a person you hung out with? You always do. Especially if you're a man trying to get a girl. You will change everything about yourself. If she's pretty enough, you'll wear skinny jeans. <laughs> Your friends will be like, what are you doing? And you're like, no, I've always liked this, dude. This has always been me. It's who I am, man, forever. And it's only when that relationship ends that you go, what was I doing? And then you meet the cowgirl. And they're like, howdy. We become who we're around. What happens when you're around somebody who's continually negative? You begin to be negative. That's why it's important to follow Jesus. Jesus did not show up to the disciples and say, here is the program, learn it. He simply said, come on, let's go hang out. And that's what we do here. We just want to hang out with Jesus so we can get to know him, so that we can become more like him. Now here's what's awesome about it. Contrary to popular Christian belief, I don't believe Jesus wants us all to look the same. 
Jesus is more than just cleaning yourself up. In fact, you really can't clean yourself up until you've hung out with Jesus and he begins to clean you. It's so funny to me, me and Pastor Alan will go and get into our circles with a bunch of other pastors and we'll hear these stories. Why do you allow those people to smoke like that? And some of you are like, hey. Why don't you tell them that they have to stop doing that to be a part of the church? Because I'll never tell anybody they can't be a part of this church. I don't care who you are. Come in here. Get loved on, hang out with Jesus, and he'll take care of it. Because you know what? There are so many people in this room that used to smoke that quit smoking. And it's not because we have a don't smoke anymore class. It's because Jesus just does his thing. And it's funny, you come forward and you'll tell me, you know, I've decided to quit smoking. And I'll be like, I'll be praying for you this week, dude. Because I know it's hard. And you may fail, and it may not work out, but then you'll try again, and eventually you get to a point where you're able to overcome that. And it's not just about smoke. It's about anything in your life that hinders you. Jesus begins to remove that slowly. And sometimes he does it like that, and sometimes, if you're like me, it's just a long process. You keep walking it out. But it is about following Jesus. In the end of the world, Jesus recognizes himself in us, and that is the determining factor for eternity placement. Here is a harsh truth for all of us. At the end of this world, you and you alone will sit face to face with Jesus. And there will be that awkward silence. Imagine when God comes back and we find that as we are waiting for him, there's this room, and there's only two chairs in it. And you sit in one, and Jesus comes in and sits in the other and just looks at you. And you start going, how many times did I go to church? Okay, hold on. Did I tithe good? Did I read enough scripture? Maybe I should say something really impressive. Uh, And Jesus says, I don't know you. You see, he didn't say, okay, how much scripture do you know? Jesus didn't say, how much did you tithe? Jesus won't sit there and say, oh, you didn't cut your hair. He'll simply say either I know you or I don't. And that's the truth, ladies and gentlemen. And that determines eternity placement, where you will live for eternity. Now, here's what's amazing. There's many people that will come before Jesus and think they know him and they won't. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 24. This is what it says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, not only, but only the ones who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoer. I never knew you. So imagine the person coming in wearing all their Jesus gear. Walk around, hallelujah, praise the Lord, God bless you, hallelujah. They will sit down before Jesus and they'll tell Jesus, oh, I went to this great crusade and I went to this promise keepers thing and I went to all these different things and I was a part of this uh, evangelism structure and I sat on many different Christian boards and, and everybody knows I'm a good Christian and Jesus will go, man, I want to know you but I don't recognize you. I I don't know you. Oh, what do you know me, Jesus? I did all these wonderful things for you. And Jesus is like, wait a second. See, that's the problem. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So you really haven't done anything except pretended. I don't know you. And then here comes the person that has scars of the world all over them. And they sit before Jesus with their head down and go, I know I don't belong in there. I know I don't. And Jesus will grab them by the head and say, look at me. I know you. I was there on that floor when everything was gone and you cried out for me. 
You and me had wonderful conversations about you and your issues, and I begin to work in you. I know you, and guess what? Everything that used to bind you is gone. Come home. You're going to live with me in the kingdom, the place where they call me king. But I don't deserve it. I know. But I know you. He will stand up and take this person before the heaven's gates and say, he's with me. She's with me. But it's only if you know him. I wish I could tell you this is how you know him. You do this, 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 and this. And, and maybe if Pastor Allen and myself were really good preachers, we would have an answer for that. But here's the truth. I don't know what Jesus has for you. That's between Jesus and you. But I will encourage you and hope that you continue to encourage me to follow Jesus. Because you can't get to the Father without him. Now I know many of you in this room are saying, well, Pastor Travis, I can understand why you say that. Because, well, you're a preacher and that's what preachers say. Please know this. A way to understand is maybe by looking at a flower. You have a little flower, it's just beginning to grow out of the ground or let's even say it's just a seed now there's two things that this flower needs in order to survive sunlight and water needs some water now the sun's going to come out isn't it and it's going to shine on everything in the world whether it's a weed or whether it's a flower whether it's a righteous person whether it's an unrighteous person whether it's a christian or not the sun is going to shine even on those 24 degree days Above the clouds, the sun is shining. But something must touch this seed. And it's the water that comes from the skies. And it begins to touch the seed, and the seed begins to split and grow. And as the water continues to pour into this flower, then it gets bigger and stronger. Not quickly. Slowly. It's a process. Your spiritual life should not be quick. It should be continual walk. All of a sudden... This flower comes out of the ground and begins to blossom. But here's something else you don't see. Below the ground, the water, it is growing the roots of this flower. This flower is getting stronger and stronger. Jesus is like this water. He is living water. It must be within you for you to grow. Now, do we know what type of flower it's going to be by looking at the seed? No, we don't. We only look at the seed and go, well, it might be a flower. How awesome would it be if all of a sudden the water goes on this little seed and it splits and and here comes this green stem and all of a sudden the flower opens up and it's all Harley Davidson signs on it. (laughs) What? That is so awesome. We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know what you're going to look like. But let the river of life, the life of Jesus flow through you. And let's see what happens. That's when you get to truly know who God is. That's when you know who God is is by knowing Jesus. In my experience, many people think I stand up here and preach because, well, it's a great career for me. It's not. I didn't want to be a preacher. I grew up in a Christian home. I did not have parents that abused anything. I always thought they were strict, but whatever. My mom and dad gave us love. They gave us encouragement. They said, do whatever you want. So I'm here growing up in the church every Sunday, every Wednesday, all of these different days the church was open. I was there. I learned the scripture. If I was told to learn the scripture and memorize it, I learned it and I memorized it. I was that guy in your high school that did the Bible studies during lunch. And I wanted everybody to know it was me doing the Bible studies at lunch, right? Because I was a good performer for God. I could say the right things. I could even go pray with that girl. For you, Jesus. All of a sudden, I get into college, and I feel like I have arrived as a man of God. I'm in college, and and I sit there, and I look at this college, and there's people drinking and sex everywhere and all this other stuff. And I'm like, oh, Lord, this is just a sinful place. Please come and burn this place down, Lord. May you do all you want and glorify your name. And little did I know, I was totally misrepresenting who Jesus and God 
are. One day as I was standing up preaching to the heretics of Texas Tech University, to the heathens of Texas Tech University, (laughs) this lady comes up to me and says, God does not need you to be his defense attorney. It's where I was offended. How dare she speak to me like that? Does she know who I am? I go home and I'm like, I can't believe the nerve of that girl. Who does she think she is? You know I'm having a problem? Because she's right. And I sat there and I started looking at everything I was taught. I realized the only reason why I believed in Jesus or believed in God was because it was a part of my culture. So I got mad. If you know me, I'm either all in or all out. And if I feel like I get duped, I'm not very gracious. I get extremely angry. So I got mad and I basically told God off and said, I don't want nothing to do with you. I'm going to go do my own thing. It seems like all this religion does is try to make somebody do what you want them to do. Religion is a manipulation tool. Six months go by. And God starts tapping me on the heart again. And I'm like, get away from me, Jesus. I'm not going to follow your rules anymore. And about that time, I get so mad at him. For about three weeks, he's prodding and poking. And finally, I man up to God because I'm pretty sure I scared him. (laughs) Pretty sure I did. In my spirit, I bowed up to him. I said, all right, you get one shot. You either show me who you are, who you really are, or I'm done. And he did. He really did. He was not the God I was taught. He was not the God that I thought he was. In fact, I always told God, I will be your warrior. In fact, when you come and take everybody, leave me here, and I will slay the demons. Right? Because, I mean, I'm the man. And God's like, you really want to be my warrior? Yes. You really want to be my warrior? Yes. He touched my heart. Pow. And I start crying all the time. <laughs> when I see people walking down the, the, the streets of the college, I'm not sitting there anymore judging them. I see them with the heart of compassion. And so instead of being this mighty warrior that I think, draw the sword, slay the demons, I'm now this guy that walks around going, are you Okay. Are you okay? Can I help you with anything? I'm going to pray for you. And I just turned into this mushy mess of that. Just (laughs) spiritual oozing of love and grace and all these things. And it changed my life. I don't stand before you today because this is a career. Because I promise you, and this has happened before any of this church stuff started. You have me flipping fries at McDonald's. I'd be telling you about Jesus. Hopefully not by my mouth, but how I live. I'll be the best fry cook on the planet. You got enough salt on your fries, man? Let me give you some more salt. You doing all right today? How's your children? Everything's doing good. You need some extra fries? Don't tell anybody. Actually, I'll pay for them because I know God don't want me to steal. So here's your fries. Your kid's okay? Is everything all right? Next thing you know, I'm going to start sitting there loving on people, and people will start going to mcdonald's to get french fries not because of the french fries because there's actually somebody behind the counter that cares about them we are people that if we follow jesus we will know the father and here is the scary thing about it you have no idea what your potential will when you become who christ calls you to be that's why it's so important in this place In this place we call refuge, that if you're sitting here, this is not one of these things that we say, I hope you enjoyed it and take it with you. We must follow Christ for the rest of this city, for the rest of this state. And I can't wait till we get to the end of this world. And on the other side, when we sit back and go, I had no idea what God was doing with the people of refuge. Because I'm going to be honest with you. There's not a lot of people of society outside with awards for us. Can I get an amen? Amen. And that includes me. But I know the Lord brought us together for a reason. And Jesus today says this. 
Come follow me. Can we do it? Because I promise you, if we do, we will have life and life to the fullest. Let's stand together. Grab the hand of the person next to you, please. Father, we come to you this morning, and I thank you so much for family. These brothers and sisters, as we all are here wanting to hear from you. And I thank you for your words, Father, for they are life. Jesus, may we know that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one can get to the Father but through you. Father, help us understand that if we read about you and we see you and we, we hang out with you more, that we will become more like you. And that is when you fill us with your spirit. Father, in this room, we don't have many actors. We are people that we just do things, Lord, and sometimes we get in trouble for what we think is right. But I thank you for your grace. And I pray right now that you fill each and every one of our hearts. Because your scripture says you stand at the door and knock. And that if we would just open that door, you would come in and reside with us. So Father, this morning right now in our hearts, we say, come in. Go with us tomorrow, Lord. Go with us everywhere we go. May we hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, amen. amen. Go and know Jesus well.